Our guest speaker today is going to be Gary Van Arnhem. Gary is with Northern Trust. Um, Gary, um, let's see, you have your Ask First form, I believe. I do. Uh, I don't have a copy of it. Thank you very much. Uh, it says here you got a bachelor's degree. Uh, are you married? <laughs> God, just <clears throat> where is what's your degree in? Finance management. Finance management. You know, you, this guy will always throw you a curve. You got to be ready. <laughs> uh, credentials. He has a CFP. Well, uh, we don't. Uh, it's a very respected one in the field. Uh, <coughs> we have a former adjunct faculty member. What is the uh, National Graduate Trust School? Uh, that's a two-year program uh, that I went to back at Northwestern University that helps you to really apply a lot of both technical and practical expertise in the day-to-day -day management of, of estates and trusts. Okay. If you see something that you don't completely understand as to what they did to earn it, ask. Okay. Like, for example, if you see the certified senior advisor, Run for the hills, <laughs> okay? It doesn't have a lot of meaning. And there's a lot of designations in this field, not just in the, uh, the legal field, but especially in the financial services area. So ask if you don't know. This is legitimate. It's actually a two-year program and you had to work for it, correct? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, okay. Um, Lee, you're not... It says here relevant licenses, you don't need a license, why? Keep in mind that when you talk about trust companies, they don't require, they don't sell, we don't sell products. So therefore I don't have to be licensed to sell products. What's the, you're chartered under the banking regulation here in California. What makes a trust company different in California versus a bank? Keep this in mind, whether you're talking about a trust company, versus a bank or even a brokerage company. Trust companies uh, have a state charter for their trust powers. In addition to being a bank, they usually have to get, or they do have to get the trust powers in order to operate as a trust company. And what that means is that trust companies hold assets in your name. Brokerage and banks have them in their names. And then basically loan them, lend them, do whatever they need. Uh, banks have FDIC, brokerage companies have SIPC insurance. Uh, big distinction here you brought out, Pete, is that, is that if anyone needs all of their assets from the bank, can everybody go in the bank and take out their money at one time? Well, why not? Where's the money? Well, loaned out. Okay, what about a brokerage company? Can everybody go into their brokerage account and say, I want to withdraw all my securities at one time? No? No? Where are, where are the securities? Lo or, or loaned out. <clears throat> Again, they can do the same thing. Trust companies have a unique distinction in that we don't show those assets on our balance sheet. Therefore, if somebody comes in and wants to take all of their securities, all of their assets out of the trust company, they can come in and do that any time they want. We, we cannot loan or lend their assets out. So in that case, we don't need SIPC or FDIC insurance. Okay. The, the other thing as well as for a trust company here in the state of California, there is a requirement to have a reserve. Why would they require Northern Trust to have a reserve and they don't have the same requirement for a bank? Well, the reserves are, are really... Uh, well, the reserves are only on the banking side, not on the trust side. Okay. So the, uh, I thought they were on the trust side as well. Did no. You to have it. Uh, the, what's the other important distinction between the trust company and the bank? And I'm talking about fiduciary uh, liability. Okay. Trust companies have to operate at a special standard. And we'll get into this in a little bit. When we're talking about someone who serves as trustee, you're held to a certain fiduciary standard best based on your talents and expertise. So, if if you appoint your uh, if you appoint your brother 
in order to be your successor trustee, the trustee in that capacity will be judged on what their talents and expertise and knowledge are in the area of being a trustee. Now, go ahead. let's go ahead and, and talk about that for a minute. Uh, Pete, if, if I go to hire you as a trustee, mm -hmm. or as a successor trustee, what sorts of expertise do you advertise that you, that you have, and what sorts of protections do you have? Uh, I do lunch and cocktails really well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's Monday morning. <laughs> it's Monday morning. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it takes, fiduciary duty takes everything into your background into consideration, so <clears throat> I am held to someone who has a standard of a graduate of law school and someone who has had experience in this area of 20 years. Okay. So. so if Uncle George makes a mistake, is his expertise or is his level of accountability different from yours? Yes. He would be held to a prudent person standard. What would somebody who wants to be have in someone's best interest that of a prudent person? Okay, now, what if Uncle George makes a mistake? Uh, how does he make the trust whole? And what happens if you should ever make your first mistake? What would you, <laughs> what would you do to make a trust whole? What the uncle does is, is, is that he would take money out of his own pocket to make the trust whole. In other words, he would be personally liable. For myself, I would be personally liable for anything that I did outside of whatever is the best interest to the client. What would you do in that circumstances if, heaven forbid, Northern Trust went outside of the scope of a fiduciary duty? Well, they would say, um, Northern Trust, we wish you to make the trust whole for whatever breach that they felt we violated. And if we couldn't come to some agreement on what that was, well, we'd probably end up in court. And what the judge is going to say is, Northern Trust, you advertise in the market that you've been doing this for over 120 years, that you have competent people, that you have expertise, you have inside counsel, you have specialists in tax, and all of this experience. You're going to have a tough time saying that you made a mistake that you, shouldn't, that you should have noticed or should have known better than to do. Uncle George... He's going to have a different story. He can go up in front of the judge and go, Judge, you know, I, I tried my best, but I really, I really wasn't totally aware of all of the implications of being a trustee. And so I, I acted as a prudent person would act. I did things that were normally prudent. I even hired good people to help me in terms of accounting and legal. But I made an honest mistake. The judge will likely say that according to the standard that Uncle George is being, or Brother George is being held to, that he's not financially liable. Even if he was, maybe Uncle George or Brother George doesn't have the capability to make that trust whole again. So there's, there's a, there's a double-edged sword there that, that you have when you have extra, extra expertise. What does Norman charge trust for its <laughs> trustee services? Our fees depend on the situation. It's kind of an old-fashioned idea about, about you should get paid according to how much you work. And so, well, basically, we have a published fee schedule, but you sit down and you work it out. You say, well, how much do you really want us to do? How much is someone else going to take care of? What's our investment management? What's our day-to-day -day operations? And it'll depend. It'll depend on whether it's a business, because we can hold a business, or real estate, or liquid securities. Trust these days, people can create wealth in all sorts of wonderful ways, and so you better be ready as a trustee to handle things such as oil and gas interests, uh, royalties and patents, people may have written books or written music, uh, small businesses, uh, of course I said real estate, and that can go a wide variety there. So when you select a trustee, you want somebody who can handle all of those assets, and there'll be d different fees that will that will vary according to that and for primarily for financial assets it's probably if you're talking about stocks bonds and cash our fees are probably going to be somewhere around what you would normally pay for most mutual funds except that you've got the added 
responsibility and liability as a trustee. Uh, and again, it depends on the size. Smaller trusts, probably two to three percent range. Larger trusts, closer to one percent or maybe even less. Pete, does that match up to what you're thinking in your fees? Yeah, our fees are approximately one to two percent per year, depending on the situation. But you should always ask for the fee schedule, either from a corporate or from a private individual. Um, my ask first form, by the way, is I have it here on the table. Most of you have it. If you don't, please get up afterwards. And if you're interested, I'll have it there. Our, there's a whole group of private <coughs> licensed fiduciaries in Orange County. Let me just kind of go through if, how to get a hold of them. <coughs> There's a professional fiduciary bureau, and if you go online and just Google it, and if you click on licensee, and then only complete Orange County, and it'll give you, click on search, and it'll give you all 40 approximately licensed private fiduciaries here in Orange County that are licensed by the state. What does licensure mean by the state? It means that someone has taken a two-hour <coughs> exam. It means that they have submitted to an FBI level two security check. And three, that they have completed the required education. Does that mean that the person once licensed is an absolute professional? I would say not. I would say it would take some experience and some time, but at least it's the beginning. The price ranges for private professional fiduciaries range anywhere from $35 an hour all the way up to $300 an hour or for a percentage of their fees. In our firm, uh, we have uh, Lisa, you want to raise your hand? Lisa is a private licensed fiduciary. Betty. Raise your hand, please. There, she's a, a licensed private fiduciary. Laura is going to be a private licensed fiduciary in a little bit. And so what we do, since we're not a corporation, uh, we die. We get sick. We go out and do little silly things. And what we do, then we ask the next individual to step in. One of the things and one of the advantages of having a corporation having be your successor trustee is that do corporations die? Not necessarily. <laughs> no. It's very rare. And so if Gary is not in the office or if Gary gets ill, then there's someone there to take Gary's place and step in on the corporation side. What are some of the other benefits of having a corporation as a trustee? Well, you're, uh, we're going to have some protections. We're going to have some other services that will work with that. Usually uh, things like financial planning or banking, investments. Those are a lot of expertise that somewhere like Northern can bring to a situation that are usually pretty necessary, pretty helpful. What makes Northern a little different than Wells Fargo, First American, uh, Bank of America, uh, trust companies? You're setting me up, aren't you? No. <laughs> uh, Northern, our business has been for 120 years just focusing on, on helping wealthy people, helping focus just on this. We're not trying to be we're not trying to be on every street corner or have a large retail branch. All we do is focus on the needs of wealthy people. Whatever they need, chances are we've got the expertise to help. And, and that's kind of the thing that works together when you have, there aren't very many simple tr situations revolving trust in the states. Everyone has something unique that requires special expertise. So that's always helpful. Yeah, the thing of it is, is, is that remember is, is that you can choose whomever you want as trustee. If you want a corporate trustee, please interview one or two or three corporate trustees because they all have different corporate cultures. Just like individuals 
we're all a little different as far as individuals and our personalities and how we do things, and that's taken into effect. Corporations have the same kind of culture. Yes. Let's repeat. Let's re repeat the question. He said, "When you when you go with Peter, you've got backups, and he's listed several of them. But when you go with a corporate, and something happens to the person that you've had the direct relationship, you just kind of thrown into the pot, and then you get who you get. No, uh, there's a lot of a lot of things that." that may be different between the way Peter and I operate, but there's one thing that's very similar to the way we operate, is that we always place the client first. This is something that, that whatever goes on, we always work together to put the client first. That means that the personal relationship that we have with an individual, a family, or a group of beneficiaries comes before everything else. Northern Trust will do fine. But it always has to start with what's best for the client. And I don't, I can't go through a day when we don't talk about a situation and all of us look at each other and say, what is best for the client? If the client needs to move to Peter, that is purely the decision, is not what's best for Northern. It's best for the client that they should be with a private fiduciary given whatever the situation might be. If something happens to me and the people come to me and, or come to the next person and say, I want to interview the person that's going to take over for Gary, and they better get along with that person. They better, they better have some sort of a personal connection. This is more than business. This is a family relationship. And if they come to the point where they say, you know what, after Gary left, I can't seem to find anybody that I'm quite as comfortable with then it's up to Northern Trust to find the right person, the right place, even if it's outside of Northern, to make that family feel welcome. Trusts these days are portable. That means that you're not stuck with your trustee for life. If somebody comes to me with a trust and it doesn't have much in the way of saying what happens if somebody doesn't like the trustee, I will, I will, get, I will recommend that they put in a provision that the trustee can be, re be removed with or without cause. Older documents may only say that you can remove the trustee with cause, meaning they made some sort of mistake. But these days, trust should be portable. Trustees should work for their living day in, day out, and not just uh, because they're stuck there. Most of you are going to name a family member, okay? So an oldest child or, you know, someone who lives near. The outline today that uh, Gary and I put together is very practical. You can give this to them and they can literally go down the list as to what to do. This is not to try to get you to the corporate trustee or to the private individual, just to understand the circumstances. Uh, in serving, you serve as the executor and personal administrator in a will, correct? Correct. And you serve as a durable power of attorney as the agent, correct? Correct. Um, do you serve for the advanced health care directive as the personal representative or the agent? Let me ask, what in the group, what is the, what is the advanced health care directive? What does the person do who's agent for the advanced health care directive? Does anybody know? They drink a lot of wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What do they do? They, they have direction, basically, from the, the individual, which tells them how they want to be treated at end-of-life decisions. Very much, very much. So or surgery, no surgery. Or yeah. they're incapacitated. Or they're incapacitated. This is somebody that you trust to make very personal decisions. This is someone that you use to either help, help when you cannot make end-of-life decisions or make treatment decisions, medical treatment decisions. So whether you want certain types of surgery or whether you don't want certain things done in, in the event that you are in a vegetative state or not, not deemed to be able to recover. There, there are some very important personal decisions there. And although we could probably do a good job at it, you, you don't want a corporation to make that decision. Um, Peter, would you make those decisions? Yes. Let's pull the plug. <laughs> Make the job really easy. Yeah, no. <laughs> Trouble is, I don't believe that. 
And then we have the living trust. Do you serve as the successor trustee, of course? Do you serve as a trust protector or as a special trustee as well? Yes, yeah, so all those except for the Vance Healthcare Directive are business type decisions. How money gets spent, how business is handled, how wills are executed according to their provisions, how trusts are handled according to those provisions. Peter, what's a trust protector? A uh, trust protector is someone who can hire and fire the trustee. Okay, what else could a trust protector do? Uh, I could basically review the annual accountings and hire special trustees or take remove the trust <coughs> essentially from the trustee who has it. Okay, and if you had special types of assets, what could you use a, a uh, protector you could for? Use the special trustee, let's say, for uh, the person is an expertise in paintings, and you could hire that or that particular individual is the special trustee just to handle all the paintings within a particular estate. So you can name special individuals. Uh, you can name a trust protector, you can name a successor trustee. Out of those individuals and all the individuals that we have listed here that potential roles, do you think your family members that are going to serve ought to be paid? Yes. Uh, everybody agree? Yes. They just should be paid. No. They shouldn't be paid. Okay. Well, there is a difference, okay? Now, let's say when you die and the family member takes over your estate, the one individual who is going to do handle your stuff as a trustee, do you think the rest of the family think that the person ought to be paid? So please put something in writing with your documents that states my family member ought to be paid or if you feel that they should not be paid let them know as well does a person that you named in your document let's say I name Northern Trust I am God does Northern Trust have to be and take my case because I have them listed in the document no so that's, a, that's an important situation. You would want to sit down with the family, particularly the beneficiaries, and say, here's the trust. Here's how we would propose to manage this trust. Here's the fees we would propose to charge. And make sure that everybody's kind of on board on that. And if you can't come to some sort of agreement, then you need to come up with another option. Yeah, I would recommend very highly <coughs> if you allow that the trustee be paid uh, but make sure the rest of the family knows about it. Uh, oh, sorry, she asked if the family member, uh, if they're paid, if that's taxable income, and the answer is yes. And that's probably the flexibility that you're talking about, Peter. You could put in there that the family member gets paid, and if the family member's a beneficiary, they may say, gee, if I don't take the payment as a trustee, I'm just gonna receive the money anyway, and it would be tax-free versus having to pay income as a trustee. So the, the trustee can waive collecting the fee, but at least that way they have a bit of an option. But I have seen, you're right, Peter, I have seen situations where the family did not want that family member to be paid whatsoever. There is no right or wrong in this, <coughs> but please just express it somewhere in writing uh, so that a person knows whether or not they have the option to be paid or not. Somebody. If I were to buy <coughs> someone to say a lay person who has some business sense, I would say not over 1% of the estate value on the date of death. That would be my recommendation. Any difference? No, no, but you have to look at it because if you have a portfolio where you're gonna pay an investment manager, let's say you're gonna pay them 1%, and they're hiring a CPA to do the taxes and all the accountings, that's another fee. The more that the trustee delegates out to others to do, and the trustee should always hire competent people to help work in areas that they're not sophisticated in, the, the more they delegate out, the less they probably should get paid. So it depends. You could have real estate management. You could have business management. We have all sorts of things that require expertise that they may or may not be doing themselves. But just generally 1% or less. Um, he asked, 
when you name somebody, particularly either a Peter or a Northern, as your successor trustee, and we're not working during your lifetime, is there any fee? No. The trusts are fully amendable and revocable. You could pull Northern or Peter out of your picture at any time. But what I do recommend, and Peter, I'm, uh, this is a good point. I want to hear your point on it, is that if somebody appoints you as successor trustee during their lifetime, what sorts of records do you keep about their trust or their activities or their important personal information? Uh, one of the things that Northern Trust has and that Gary has, and I think you can make it available, is an estate organizer. If you somehow you have an estate organizer, that would be an immense benefit for your successor trustee, whomever it is. Do you have one that's available? Yeah, I do, and uh, I, I didn't, it's a Word file. If you'll just email me, uh, my email is on the, uh, on, right the, on, the on the handout. If you'll just email me, it's a Word file, I'll just attach it and send it back to you and you can fill it out. The, the handy part about it being a Word file is you can always keep it on your computer and update it. If you want me to send you a hard copy, I'd be happy to do that too. But I, what I'm saying here is that, is that while you're alive and you've got all this great information about your own situation, don't make it a Sherlock Holmes after you're gone because your successor trustee is going to need that information and you think it's so easy. Well, it's in the top drawer of my dresser. Well, nobody knew that that was there. Well, I had three safe deposit boxes. Well, who knew to, to keep looking after they found the first key? So there are a lot of things in your personal life, your funeral arrangements, your advisors. I've even had people give me the whole rundown about how they want the music they wanted in their funeral, the people who weren't invited there. Uh, anything that they wanted to make sure that somebody knew about should go in that organizer. And Peter, you keep this information? Absolutely. Yeah. Please let the person know who you've named and sit down with them. If you've named somebody as the successor trustee, I'm surprised how many times are you, do you all of a sudden have a letter on your desk saying that you're named and you've never met the individual? It does happen, but you're hoping it doesn't happen very often. I had one where I went to a gentleman's home and I knew he had two cars. Uh, I knew he had a second a Mercedes and I couldn't find it. And, and lo and behold, in the top drawer, he had one of the organizers and I pulled it out and lo and behold, in Austria, at his second property, there was the Mercedes sitting there at the house. So the organizer is going to really simplify somebody's life. And you had to go to Australia? Just to Austria? <laughs> Austria? No, they would, <laughs> wouldn't sign off. We, we hired somebody local. Uh, the question was, does Northern Trust handle life insurance trusts? Life insurance trusts are a unique beast because during the life of the insured, not much happens except for the crummy letters, the letters to the beneficiaries and then a process where the premium payments are made. Um, we can talk separately on this. There are ways to make life insurance trusts more effective. Typically, Northern would step in at the time of the triggering event, at the time the life insurance policy matures. Then we would step in and make sure that it's properly administered and that all the tax... Uh, we could. It's sometimes more expensive to have us do it, and we can sometimes come up with ideas that will save you money and not eat up so much during your lifetime. Again, yes. this is not about Northern Trust. This is about making the best for the client. Okay. Will you serve as a co-trustee, Gary, with a uh, private individual? Peter, some of the best relationships I have is when I'm a co-trustee, when I can balance the Northern the northern expertise and I can lend that to my co-trustee and say listen you don't want to do this you can do that we got to be careful to do this and then on the other side they're saying Gary um, it wasn't the dad's habit to buy his son a Ferrari so you know it was a hundred dollars at Christmas and so we can balance a lot of what the fiduciary side with the personal side in a co-trustee relationship they've been very worked very well I, I will very rarely serve with a, a lay person as co-trustee and the reason for that is is that a lay person I'm going to be just as liable for his or her actions as he or she is with mine 
I try to explore the issue. Is what is the purpose to have co? If the purpose to have co is to keep an eye on me, then I would rather have them serve as the trust protector that they can hire and fire me. It's just that it makes it cumbersome if to have two co-trustees with equal powers, then we have to both agree on everything. And I'd be serving with someone who is an amateur. And it'll be more expensive. There's more potential for conflict. I don't like to do it. Um, I, you know, Northern Trust does do so. Um, uh, it'd have to be a special situation where I would see a co-trustee. I normally don't recommend it. It's just that we get this idea that being a trustee is a position of honor. It isn't. It's administrative work. Has anybody been a trustee? Is it a position of honor? No. no. Did everybody appreciate all the hard work you did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, and so, but if we're not there, they think it is, and this is a way to protect. So unless there's a special reason that I think that the co-trustees will work, more than likely I would refuse to take the case. Well, I think, yeah. Th okay. There, Let's... There, what happens is family members are usually chosen first. And then sometimes they're CPA. If the CPA has never done this kind of work, they're just lousy people to name. Okay? They'll learn it and they'll know it, but they're not going to be doing the, the nitty gritty of the work. They'll have someone in their office do the work. It's the same thing if you have a family member. Who usually goes, who does the family member go to upon your death? To your attorney. And the paralegal steps in and <coughs> helps out, right? So that's usually a lot of times what happens. Who's watching the attorney and the paralegal? Hopefully the beneficiary and the family member. You have a trust company who can serve and then you have a private fiduciary. Okay, so there's lots of folks involved, if you can, and lots of choices that you could make. Who supersedes if there's a co-trustee and there's a, there's, a, there's a genuine issue of disagreement? Some, if you can't get along with somebody who's your co-trustee, somebody's going to have to either agree these two parties are going to have to agree in some fashion or one person's going to have to step aside okay. and, and and peter I, I thought that was a really good discussion because you can have situations where a co-trustee works and you can have situations where depending on the personality and the type of assets and the function and the and the beneficiary is named a trust protector someone who is there to take over certain functions may work better yeah it's if you think of it, the problem a lot of times is, 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 is that you name a family member and they think they may have to do everything themselves. And it, what they ought to be doing is thinking about it as a CEO. They don't have to sell the house, but they have to make sure that they hire the correct individual to sell the house. They don't have to do the tax return, but make sure that they don't hire H&R Block to do a 706 return, okay? Make sure that they have somebody and hire somebody competent to handle uh, the last tax return who's used to doing fiduciary work. Um, if, they, if the house needs to be fixed up to be put on the market, do they know and hire good contractors who can fix up the house in a decent amount of time to get it on the market? So. From my point of view, the trustee is more like a CEO. I am only as good as my network. Gary, uh, you rely on all your network, correct, as far as Northern Trust is concerned in getting things done besides the fact of additional staff. See, and, and this is important because the, the thought would be, gee, we're Northern Trust, we can do so many things, we don't need anybody. That's that couldn't be further from the truth. When we step in as successor trustee, I want to know who the CPA, I want to get together with the CPA who has worked with this family 
for 20 years and knows where everything and how things have been done. I want to get together with the business manager, the life insurance agent, whatever professional, the attorney, whatever professional team that helped this person during their lifetime or this family, you're best off to keep that team together unless there's a reason not to. So you got, and, and that can be a problem sometimes for someone who's an individual. Say you have three children and you appoint your oldest son because that's the honor bestowed on your oldest son. And the first thing he or she might do is say, gee, I really don't want to spend too much money. I think I can save a little bit on on the accountant or the attorney or not call these people quite so often, that is a big mistake. Also, Peter, yes. I have three kids and I, and I want to appoint my son as the, as the trustee, but I'm afraid, I'm afraid his brother and sister won't be quite so happy, so I think what I'm going to do is appoint all three of them as co-trustees. Yeah, an absolute disaster. <laughs> But that way they can all work it out. <laughs> yeah. The thing of it is, is, is when you name three people or even when you name two people, you go to the financial institution to marshal the asset. What are they going to want to see? They're going to want to see everybody's driver's license. They want to get everybody's signature. And they want to make sure that all three are cooperating. Because if they hand the monies over to the free trustees and there's a problem, the bank or the financial institution may be held liable. And so, three, two, I've seen it work out. By the way, 80%, I'm talking for most everyone, no matter how awful your document is written, no matter how bad your family is, it always seems to work out. I don't want this to be a, come a session where we're putting the fear of God in you and that you have to uh, hire Gary and Northern Trust. You do have to hire me, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay? Uh, but most things work out, and I don't want you to come out of here this session thinking that there's going to be a problem. But if you know that there's going to be a problem, deal with it now instead of later. Should you tell, should you tell your successor trustee how much money you have? You know, um, I would give them a, somewhat of a ballpark as to the successor trustee, but I would not get into the details. It's one of the reasons why we named the program It's Your Estate. Maybe we should have put a little thing underneath that said, not your children's yet. Okay? Or maybe You're ever. in control. Okay? And make sure you stay in control. You'll live longer. You'll be happier if you're in control. So if you think that you have a bully son or daughter who's going to try to take control, then don't let them know anything. On the other hand, if you think that there's a person there that can you can speak with, the more they know about your estate, the better off they're going to be. But it's each individual family's decision. Honey, I never did trust your brother. Do <laughs> you want to go out for a drink after that? <laughs> uh, if you're going to name a child or whomever, think of location. Uh, for example, we're located here in Orange County. We usually, very rarely, will take a trusteeship that's outside of Orange County. We just know everybody here, our network is here. Uh, uh, Northern Trust, I think if you have properties in all different states or multinational, I think Northern Trust is almost a slam dunk if you have that kind of a situation. So location becomes really important. Does the trustee have the skills, you know, to handle your situation? Do the family members trust? Remember, they haven't lived together for 30 to 40 years. Do they trust? Do the in-laws trust? You know, is that when someone dies, does the property immediately go to the successor beneficiaries or to the beneficiaries? In their mind, it does. 
what is the normal routine when someone dies? Is there kind of a notice that has to be given? Well, we've got, this is, this is a good point. Uh, there's, uh, here's a timeline that we can kind of talk about here. The first thing that the trustee or successor trustee, let's say, let's say the person who created the trust has passed or the surviving spouse has passed. We now have stepped in and we've said, we've looked at everything. The successor trustee is, has, made a, has made an educated decision to continue to step in and serve as successor trustee. The first thing they have to do is send a notice to the beneficiaries. And in this notice it will say, so and so passed away, I'm now going to serve as successor trustee, this is my address, this is my phone number, <coughs> and by the way, here is a copy of the trust. You as the beneficiary should take a look at this and, and make sure that you understand it, take it to an attorney if you need to. And during that particular, particular period of time, any one of the beneficiaries can protest the document, can protest the naming of a particular successor trustee, but we, do we do anything during this 120 day period? No, you're basically making sure that everybody knows what's going on. And it used to be a problem. There was a time in California when we didn't have this notice. And we talked about the three kids where, where older brother was the successor trustee. He could effectively, at death, go in and take over the entire estate and make mistakes, spend the money, take trips, do whatever he wanted and his sister probably wouldn't even know anything about that trust because it was a private document. So this notice to beneficiaries is a very important protection and it only exists if the successor trustee uses it. And if you don't hear anything, do you think everything is going well? No. No. And so communication, you know, besides having some business skills, make sure your successor trustee communicates with the rest of the beneficiaries. What if you're contacted by a family member who is not a named beneficiary of the trust? Happens all the time. I've got, I've got the black sheep child who I've eliminated from my trust and do I send them a notice? Better talk to the attorney about that because there may be a reason to send that person a notice anyway to let them know they should Oh, I got to be careful here. The, there could be, it could be construed that they should receive notice and see that they are not in the trust and be able to have that out there. The people to whom are the natural beneficiaries can be sent this notice, but it is a, it is a very important conversation with the attorney as to which of those people you would actually send that notice to and which not. I guess you can imagine some of the situations both ways. What the question is, when you send them the notice, do, you, do they get a copy of the trust? Peter. Yes. Okay, there was a family member who named their uh, beneficiaries as the A beneficiaries received 50,000, the B beneficiary received 25,000, the C beneficiaries received 10,000. She was in here about two years ago, and she asked me afterwards, she said, will all my beneficiaries know if they were A, B, or C? And the answer is, yes. yes. She changed her trust. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody gets a copy of the trust who's an immediate family member and those individuals that are named in the document. Okay? And that goes for full disclosure. Yes. The question is, does the attorney who drafted the trust automatically do that when a person dies? And the answer is no. You can go to any attorney to do the trust administration. A little bit about the practicalities of the law. You do not have to go back to the same attorney who drafted your document. Today, probably every legal practice in Orange County, almost, 60, 40 to 60 percent of their practice is trust administration. So you can go to any estate planning attorney and they will assist you to administrate that estate. And yes? Uh, do you have to also notify contingent beneficiaries or just the... If they're named in the document. Oh, okay. Okay? Every name in the document has to be notified that here's the trust and their, their name. 
there are certain protections to, to sending people the notice. That can also create certain problems. But you want to look at, at what sorts of protections sending that notice to that beneficiary might assist. It used to be private. Now there was a gentleman that was in Laguna Hills by the name of Gunderson. And he did not send out notices of the trust. And it went all the way to the California Supreme Court and got settled. Whereas today, everybody receives notice of the trust. Okay, he's saying, do you, is a certified letter sufficient or do you need a, a return acknowledgement? There's a statutory requirement for this notice right down to the size of the font. It's not something you want to do yourself. You want an attorney to draft it. But Make sure it's done let, right. Let's answer your question. Sending a letter certified return receipt is a very good idea. So that you acknowledge that they had, because that triggers a period of time under which they can contest the trust. Major issue on AB trust on the first spouse to die. Who usually gets named on the B trust as a successor trustee? Surviving spouse. Is there a little emotion going on there? Is there some issues there? Do the immediate lead a survivor spouse go see the attorney and say, what do I need to do? No. We see so many AB trust scenarios where 10 years later, there has been no separation of the assets. CPA has not been involved. An attorney has not been involved. If you have an AB trust, please talk to your spouse and say, get some help if one of us dies so that we can put it in the correct order. There needs to have some things done. So we see this really common. You need some skill to make sure that the assets are separated into the proper trust. Okay, we're gonna hold off on the questions a little bit right now. Let's go through part of the outline. We're not gonna get through the entire outline. The nice thing about the outline though, it's very practically written. You can put it with your documents and someone can go through it themselves. If you have a question, there's an email for the both of us. There's a telephone number. As we like to say in this field, the attorneys draft the documents. We drive these documents. So we understand the practicalities and can answer those issues and questions for you whether or not, again, you become a client of either court, uh, of uh, Norman or myself. In distributing a particular estate, do you have any times problems understanding the value of particular items? Oh gosh, yes. And, and you, can, you can err on the side of, of undervaluing or, or maybe sometimes overvaluing those assets. Yeah, it's uh, people who overestimate their household items. When you buy a couch from, let's see, from where? <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> uh, and you want to put it on the curb to sell it the next day. What do you think it's going to be worth? You know, not much. No, even though it's brand new. Okay. What I see personal items being uh, overvalued. Is personal items ever an emotional issue? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Everything that happened to a family when they were when they were kids in the sandbox comes up and rears its ugly head when it comes down to the simplest of, of personal property items. And what Peter said has a lot of value too because not only do people get into disagreements over personal property, but as he said, personal property has very little value. So the last thing you want to see is trying to liquidate personal property for money. It's better to give it to people and then hopefully give it to the, to the people in a way that's equitable. And trying to figure out if if you've got a, a pair of earrings and I go in and I'm trying to find the ones that you've lent or that you want to go to your to your niece and then I I find that there's five sets of earrings how do I know which one is the one for which party it, it, it's a it, personal property can be a, an area where there's a lot of emotion yeah. and well as well uh, some some value is 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 always a question yeah put a letter with 
your documents and say, uh, if you want to give away personal property to particular family members, and put a letter with your estate planning documents and say, hey, I wish the following to go to. And then you can list it. Now the problem sometimes is, 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 is that when you write that letter and by the time you die, those personal items may not be there. So we've seen that as well. And personal items, I've seen $20 million estates. And what is the argument over? A small personal heirloom. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the big thing. Emotions are just running at a peak, okay? It's kind of like when mom or dad dies, now I have permission to tell you exactly what I think of you. <laughs> Peter, tell me, so, so there's all sorts of personal property. What do you do to secure the property? What do, what do you do with the residence, for instance? Uh, immediately upon death, we change locks. Okay? And we recommend you, as your successor trustee, do the same. Okay, if I had a painting on the wall here for 20 years, and if somebody removes it, do you think I will know whether or not there was a painting on that wall? Yes, okay? It's quite common. Mom wanted me to have that painting. So the first thing we do is we change locks. What's the second thing that happens, Gary? Mail. Things, oh, we're going to talk about food in the refrigerator? Well, then we could do that, but let's not go there. It's, ugly. it's an ugly story. What about insurance? That's a very important item. Be careful. Some sorts of property and casualty insurance is void after the home is vacant for more than 30 days. One of the most important functions, the primary function of a trustee, a successor trustee, is to preserve and protect the estate. That has a lot to do with making sure that the insurance coverage is both current and that the agents are aware of everything that's going on. Cars, boats, airplanes, real estate, all sorts of liability coverages. Get a hold of the agent, say, listen, uh, just so-and-so passed away, we're taking over the house, we want to make sure the insurance is still in force. A lot of times people near end of death may have missed that notice for the premium payment. You want to make sure that that property is protected. Remember the fiduciary has that obligation. Yeah, and it's not to grow the estate, okay? If we have uh, 200,000 shares of Apple stock on the day to death, what do you do with the Apple stock? Well, I don't know. It's, it's probably sell it, but, but you, need, you need to make a thoughtful decision on that dis discussion. Yeah, so it's preserve, not grow the estate. Yes, you had a question. What about rental properties? The same thing applies. Preserve, not grow. So make sure that there's insurance on the rental property. Make sure that the, that the property is safe. Make sure that the rents are collected. Now, now mom, and dad, uh, mom and dad passed away, and I, I just want to let you know, Peter, I, I stopped by the house, and I picked up a few things today that were mine that were in the house. <laughs> I would ask you to return those things until the estate is settled. But they were mine. I, I just, they were sitting in the house there. Until we have <laughs> definite proof that they were yours, please return them to the house. I was just there checking up on things, you know. Did you not hear me? <laughs> I used to do assertive mistreating, and you have to become like a broken record. And because this is exactly what happens. And you keep repeating, but you need to return it. Yes, we understand, but please return it. Uh, everything needs to, no distribution takes place until when? Well, you've got to go through and, and, and well, you've got to go through and make sure how much money you're going to need to pay taxes and handle the management of the property. And it may be a few months. It may be, it may be nine months before you can do anything. Yes. What if you have judgment and creditors and all sorts of things? Uh, when you have a probate, you have a period that's public. You send out notices to everybody that conceivably that you know of and even that you might not know about might owe 
might, the state might owe that person money. You publish notice in the newspaper telling everybody possible that this person has died and if you have a claim against this estate, you need to file that. What happens with a trust? No creditor claim period, it's a private document. If you think that you might want to exercise the creditor claim period under a trust, you can do so. Well, it doesn't enter in, but you need to let everybody know because if you don't let everybody know that this is happening and that you're trans distributing all the money out of this estate, that, that judgment will follow those beneficiaries. Or and they'll go after them. Or after the trustee, your successor trustee for payment. You, mom lends money to son to start a business, $50,000. Does mom want son to repay that debt upon her death? It was a gift. It wasn't a loan. It was a gift. Mom, mom, mom just said it was a loan, but she didn't really mean it. She was. It was just a gift. I don't I have, have to pay it back. I have two other kids in the family to say that it was a definitely a loan. It wasn't a gift at all. I never liked them anyway. <laughs> as soon as you lend money to one of your kids, every other child will know that you lent money to them. It's especially family radar that immediately everybody knows. Okay, what the problem is though is, is that nobody puts a document with the, with the estate planning documents either indicating the loan is forgiven on my death or the loan needs to be repaid. Please, if you lend money to somebody, please make a note and put it with your documents. Another thing, are any of these documents fun to read upon a death? No. no. Does any of these documents contain the word love? No. no. In fact, it's discouraged, okay? <laughs> Put a letter with your documents and say at least twice in that letter the word love, okay? It has nothing to do with legalese. When someone dies, it is a highly emotional uh, situation. And so if they have a personal letter from you indicating how you feel about them, if, you, if it's positive, <laughs> please include it with the documents. It goes a long way in soothing some of the ruffled feathers in doing your estate plan. It's it, something personal. It, it should not be legally binding. No. It should be an expression of your wishes and desires and feelings. In the business, we call that precatory language. It, it is something to, to help understand the thinking and feelings of the person who created that letter, but is no way intended to supersede any of the legal binding documents. If even especially, let's say, if you have a spendthrift son or daughter, state in the letter, I didn't give you the principal because you are a spendthrift. They know they are spendthrifts, okay? And at the same time, you can state in there, even though you're a spendthrift, I still love you. That has nothing to do with it. But for this particular purpose, I have extended income over your lifetime. And that is an adult way to handle things. What happens a lot is moms and dads get afraid of the children and don't want to tell them anything. Please put a letter together. I'm going to go start on page two. We've got a good 25 minutes, so let's go through it. Does each one of you have a list of the family members that you want to get have notified? Do you have friends that you want to have notified upon your death? If you don't, put one together. It would be of an immense help. Do you go through Christmas cards and try to figure out names and addresses? Oh gosh, yes, and address books and everything else. Yeah, so if you have a list for yourself, it would be wonderful. Um, uh, it, the emotional impact when someone dies. Uh, what's the kind of the average state of shock people are in uh, after a death? 
Yeah, and that's one of the, the and, and that's the, the situation. You want to make sure that that certain people have the time to reflect and to go through their, their grieving process and don't burden them with a lot of financial other obligations they have to deal with at that time. There are certain deadlines and timelines that occur after death. And yeah. If you want the entire family to be flown to Arlington Cemetery, to be put up at the Mayflower, and to be flown back at your expense, please state that in your trust. Or something that says, this is what I would like. I want doves to fly out of the coffin <laughs> at the funeral. Okay? I want the term, I want a parking meter that says expired on my grave. <laughs> Whatever you want, you can have, but put it in writing. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, we talked a little bit about security at the decedent's house. Uh, that we talked a little bit about perishable property. Some people like animals more than humans. Anybody raise their hand? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a lot of things that you can do if you like your animals as far as giving it over to someone else to care for. They have uh, pet trust today, uh, etc. So make sure that you take care of that beforehand. <laughs> Um, who takes care of the funeral arrangements? Well, it could be somebody that is holding, well, the advanced health care, well, you're talking about the, the advanced health care directive agent can handle that. Um, and then who pays? <laughs> the trustee. So they better get along, huh? And where do I find, what if I, if I want to keep those safe, do I put those in my, in my safe deposit box? Please don't put your legal documents in your safety deposit box. Wait, wait, wait. Not any legal documents? No, not any. I don't think any. Your original documents? I don't think so. I would put them in, in the house, keep them with the attorney. There's. I don't think you're going to get a burglar to come into the house and say, let me find that estate planning document. <laughs> well, what if the house burns down? The house burns down, make sure you have a copy someplace else. Okay, I would suggest the original be in the safe deposit box and copies be yeah. in the house. Safety deposit boxes are sometimes a real problem. If I go into the safety deposit box, is there anyone with me when I go in? No, I don't have to, but I always will. I always take four set of eyes on whatever we open up to see what's in there. Because what happens if mom said in her agreement, I have the, the, the Blue Hope diamond ring, $30,000 in my safety deposit box. Hey, I went and, I, and looked and it wasn't there. And it wasn't there. I call them up. I'm sorry, no diamond ring. What are they going to be leave me? No. Okay? So safety deposit boxes are kind of a trap. So be careful. Uh, you can name your, you know, the, um, uh, your stock certificates, your bonds. Keep them in a discount brokerage. It's much safer. You don't have to worry about fire, yeah. um, et cetera. Anybody still have any stock certificates or, or bearer bonds? Yeah, keep them in, uh, keep it in uh, the street name with a brokerage firm. It's a lot safer. What if um, it's a private company? What's that? What if it's a private company? Then you, you're, you've hit the one situation where we can't. Yeah, they're not DTC eligible. Yeah, if, but, and you hit a very good point. When we sit here, stand up here and talk, we're talking about generalities. Okay, it may not apply to every single particular situation that you have. And so thank you for uh, that comment, it, it, it's perfect. Gary, is there a place in you when, uh, uh, that you can possibly locate items as to their, you know, uh, uh, besides the house? Yeah, what about, uh, has anyone ever found escheated assets on the internet? Escheated assets, is that a new term? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, interesting. So, so if you had, if you were back in high school, when you opened up your first bank account, and then your folks moved away and you forgot about that bank account, guess where that bank account went? To the state. To the state. That is called an escheated asset. 
And it could contain all sorts of things. I have a client right now where we found about, mm, about three quarters of a million dollars worth of, of missing assets. And every, oh, wait, time I, every time I thought I had them all, something else popped up. You can go on the internet. Yes. In the, fact, Gary put an article out uh, on the table um, about finding unclaimed property. Unclaimed property. It's the state controller's office. There's actually a website there that, that claims to capture all of the states. I've tested it, and it didn't quite work. So the idea is to go to every state. It's kind of a fun exercise. You can pick on your neighbors. You can, you can go to your, your kids. You can, I found assets for all sorts of people that I basically said, here, you guys got to go claim this money. And, and you, it's called unclaimed property. Google it. Every state has usually a site, and uh, it's exactly right. I, I always find people that I know. I put my friends in as far as their names are concerned. Give them a call and say, hey, you've got some assets that are, are with the state of California, and you just follow the directions and you can claim that property. Um, Let me bring up another issue is though most of the assets we recently found were dividend reinvestment plans. They're known as DRIP accounts where somebody has gone to IBM and started an account with IBM where they actually take the dividends on a particular holding of that IBM stock and the dividends are reinvested in additional shares called dividend reinvestment plan. And companies will host those sorts of programs for uh, people who want to be investors in that company. And in this case, we'd found a mom who had created drip accounts all over the place. And we had to go through transfer agents to find all of those drip accounts. Another area. And drip accounts can also be an area where you don't get a regular statement necessarily. You may get the 1099 with the tax information, but that's another place where you can find missing assets. Um, how many tax returns need to be filed in the first year of death? Well, okay, so we've got... We've got, uh, we've got the 104540, that's an easy one. There's the first two. Now, once the, pers once the trust becomes irrevocable, meaning once the person dies and their wishes become cast in stone, that then becomes an administrative trust. An irrevocable trust is created as an administrative trust after the death of an individual. That will trigger a separate tax return because that is a separate tax, the trust then becomes a separate tax paying entity and it's required to be filed a 1041 versus a 1040 or a 541 versus the 540. There's also other sorts of notices that are required in regards to the return. Yeah, so you basically have four tax returns that you need to file. Hire the appropriate CPA who has some fiduciary tax return experience. He asked what happens to the property taxes when you get a basis step up at death. The property taxes will depend on who the beneficiary is to that property. The property taxes will not change strictly based on the step up in basis, but if it goes to children or grandchildren, there are certain exemptions where you can maintain the current uh, property tax uh, basis for, for purposes uh, of that transfer. Do you have to take some steps or is that automatic? Great question. There is a requirement that those, and I can't recall the exact parameters, but if you don't file that. Six months. Is it six months? If you don't file that within six months, um, you jeopardize that as well as have certain penalties. So that's another one of the checklist items a successor trustee needs to be aware of is to file for that, particularly when it's going to transfer to family members and can be, and that, that property tax basis can be preserved. We hire attorneys upon someone's death. Just the notification that needs to go out on uh, the 120-day notice with the trust, that letter needs to have a certain font size in order to be legal. That's how particular they are. Everybody needs to get notification. Uh, the tax returns, the Prop 13 issues. Is appraisals ever an issue? Oh, gosh. Yeah, there's certain situations where you may, you may hope for the lowest possible value for the property. There may be some where you are not as concerned about 
getting a low appraisal. So yeah, appraisals are very key in tax planning. Yes, and there's a certified appraisal out there and you gotta hire the appropriate individual. Whether you're talking about paintings, whether you're talking about uh, artwork, whether you're talking about real estate. This is not the time to go cheap, okay? This is the time to hire the good professionals because you is every 706 return uh, uh, audited? I would say pretty much they are. You, you, and in fact, most situations I say to the IRS, give it your best shot because we don't want to wait around for three years to get a, a statute release. Yes. So you'd want to make sure you do it right. And the revenue agent on the IRS side earns about $5,000 in taxes per hour. So people who don't do it right, and it's, they don't check off the appropriate box, don't do, this is not amateur hour when you get into a larger estate. What's a um, Oh, I'm sorry, we're using jargon and thank you. The federal estate tax return where you report your estate is called a IRS form 706. And it is, it is the 706 represents a snapshot in time and it can be that it can be the date of death or it could be in a, an alternate value six months after but it represents a snapshot of everything that decedent owned as of that point in time and so it's going to have a value Is there a minimum on, that? on the 706 there are well for the next two years there are certain situations where you may you may decide to file an estate tax return even if the estate is less than the five million that we have for the next couple of years just because you want to you want to memorialize certain things or you've taken certain discounts and you want that to be a matter of record but typically it's five million dollars or ten million for a couple uh, how many death certs uh, should a trustee or successor trustee get question for the group how, how many people have have ordered death certificates and found out they ran out <laughs> what Get would, it up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say 12, depending or you know, 15, depending on the 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 financial institutions. Every financial institution wants to see a death cert. An original, original, not a photocopy. Not a photocopy. So they have to be a certified copy. Yes. Um, let's see. Obtain evaluations. We talked about that final tax return, estate tax return. Uh, on number 38, we have it in bold. Keep the beneficiaries re informed regardless of legal duty to do so. What do you mean by that? Well, Peter, you said that earlier. Here it is. I'm, I'm successor trustee for my parents' trust. Everything's just going really smooth. I'm just happy at this because one of the things that Peter didn't put on here was time. I don't have time. I don't have time to be babysitting a bunch, of, a bunch of beneficiaries, particularly if everything's running smooth. I'll let, them know when it's, I'll let them know when there's something to tell them. Right now, everything's just working out great. Okay? What's my sister think? What's going on? And I never did trust your brother. He's saying, listen, I haven't heard a thing from anybody. That means that there's something wrong. So the idea of keeping beneficiaries informed is really a smart idea in the long run. It builds a lot of trust and confidence in what, in what they're doing. What's the most common question you get from a beneficiary? When? when? when. That's right. And how much? Okay. It is a legal technical term, pillow talk. What does that mean? <laughs> Why is your brother holding out on us? Why isn't he giving us the money that's ours? Okay, lots of that going on, okay? And it may not be your son or daughter, it may be an in-law that basically says, how do you know your family is trustworthy? Did and you ever so, get a you ever get a phone call from the 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 car dealership or the uh, or the uh, escrow real estate escrow company? Oh yeah. The, many a time the beneficiaries have your money spent before you're even cold. Okay, and so you get calls from the dealership, you get calls from the escrow, you get calls from the loan company verifying that the assets are there and so that they can get a loan. So uh, 
you know, it's, it happens much more often than you like to think. Now remember, we're kind of like the cops who, you know, deal with the, the, the bad folks uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, they don't name a private, most people don't name a private fiduciary or a corporate for the good reasons. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's just because there's a major problem within the family. So sometimes we tend to be, at least I do, a little bit cynical sometimes about the situation. But I want to go back to what we said in front and said most mm -hmm. trust, most estate plans go very orderly and there is not a problem. The, the issue is, is that we have about, what, 3.5 million people here in Orange County. So even when we have a small percentage, that is a lot of problems that are out there. Um, so please choose your successor trustee. By the way, how many individuals ought to name um, as, in, for example, in a will? We named down three, but uh, is there a rule that says that you have to do three? No, and, and really what you want to do is, is have a backstop. So whatever number you pick, you should at least have somebody at the very end who you know is kind of a fail safe and sometimes that becomes a private fiduciary or a corporate fiduciary. You may have you may have uh, business manager number one, you may have child number two, you may have another child here, but eventually these people may step out of the out of the may, may decline to act because of they don't have the time, they don't have the expertise, whatever other reasons are legitimate and you need somebody kind of as a backup say what's going to happen if all these people don't don't decide to to take this on what are you going to do here do you do you really want them to have to go to court to pick to pick the last one you know, one of the things that you may want to look in your documents and take a look in there to see whether or not the successor trustee that you have named has the power to appoint a successor trustee. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for instance, you name John as your successor trustee. Does John have the right to name a successor? It's called a power of appointment. We recommend it, we like it, it's just that it prevents from having to go to court in the event maybe the successor to John doesn't want to serve. There may be situations, though, where you like John and you think he would make a fine successor trustee, but you don't necessarily want to give him that power to pick his successor. You trust him, but you worry about what might happen. So you, you kind of have to weigh that out. Do the beneficiaries have any power over the trustee? We talked about that earlier. The power to remove the trustee, making a trust portable, is very important but you want to have some restrictions on that. You don't want them trustee shopping every time somebody tells them no. So you may put certain criteria such as they can't change trustees more than once every five years. Or if, they, if you're working with a corporate trustee, they have to be a corporate trustee of a certain size. Also, you want to say that it has to be a majority of the competent adult beneficiaries who have to come together and make that decision. On page three, right in the center, it says general trustee duties, specific duties, loyalty. What does loyalty mean? Means you have one allegiance, and that is to that trust and those beneficiaries. You have to do everything with the thought in mind that this is for their best interest. So mom has a car, that Mercedes, uh, she, I knew she just wanted, she wouldn't mind me driving it while we try to figure it out. Can I do that? Heavens no. Okay. Let me try this one, Peter. Um, when dad, oh, let me put it this way, when dad, or two ways. When dad was alive, he was a very smart businessman. He invested our money in some very good investments that not everybody would have invested in. They were a little bit risky, but dad was really smart. I'm going to invest the money the same way dad did. I would say wrong answer. Okay? But what is the duty of a successor trustee? Is to preserve, not to grow. If the beneficiaries want to follow dad's way of investing, 
then they'll wait until they get the dollars and then they can invest according to the way dad wanted it to. Okay. On the other hand, if dad said in writing to the trustee, I want you to do blah, 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 then the successor trustee can hide behind that uh, the trustor's directions and follow through on that. Okay, well, what, uh, then I'll tell you what. Then I'll just invest. I invest my money a certain way, and it's pretty smart. It's, it's pretty conservative and pretty prudent, but I take a few risks. I'll just go ahead and invest the trust money the same way I invest my own money. Wrong answer. Okay, wrong answer. Again, it's to preserve. Can't get anything right around here. <laughs> <laughs> that the idea is to preserve money market funds, CDs. We don't invest in, if you have a trust, let's say that goes out for a minor child and for 20 years, now we can invest in the stock market, put a balanced portfolio together, etc. But when we're talking about an administrative or a distribution trust, we want that money absolutely to be safe. 